strange world of industrial chemistry. Streaming daily into over 50 explosive and chemicals plants across the nation, the tide of workers floods in. And as more than 50,000 men and women crowd towards the gates, men and women who once worked on farms, in garages and in stores, they become part of an industry whose soaring expansion is one of the great stories of Canada's wartime mobilization. In busy cities, on vacant land, from swamps and woodlots, Plants have grown up covering an area large enough to blanket the city of Montreal and owned by the people of Canada. This is the tough, brilliant groundwork by which we have become the fourth industrial power among the United Nations. This is the face of the men who built an industry turning out today more military explosives in six months than during the whole of the last war. Look to the prairie. Here are gleaming new plants where skilled technicians harnessing Canada's stores of natural gas go about their dangerous business of producing thousands of tons of ammonia, basic factor in explosive making. From the energy of planned construction, from the new plants with their great vats and stills, their gleaming tanks, come the chemicals for the mounting Allied offensive. Deep in the mountains, where smoking chimneys thrust high into the gorges, the loaders clank endlessly, and men work to produce ammonium nitrate. The dry powder that mixed with TNT makes the deadly explosive Amatol. The dry powder that can also refertilize and revive thousands of overworked farms. Eastward again, the rapid flow of explosives come from new plants for safety spread out over as much as nine square miles. And behind their strange shapes is the brute power that in skilled hands can hasten victory. No matches, pas d'allumette. It's not just reasonable precaution, it's the rigid rule in every plant. The lives of thousands of workers depend on one thing, act safely, follow the rule. Right at the plant entrance comes the division between the clean side and the dirty side. Beyond the white line lies a world without matches, without lighters or watches, or even shoe nails. Without rayon or artificial silk, nothing that can possibly generate friction or static. Treading the catwalks leading to the widely separated buildings, the exposed worker prepares for his final transformation in the change house. Off come street shoes loaded with metal, clothes that may contain pens or key cases or coins. The storekeeper, the service station man, the farm boy, dons the uniform of those who work with the materials of annihilation. A final search, and he passes over into a land of spotless cleanliness, peopled by men who move with sure precision. For eight hours every day, he leaves the outer world behind.
Every explosive worker, every plant sprung from the soil of Canada, depends upon rows of little bottles full of substances with strange sounding names. And working in a maze of twisted glass is their guardian, the industrial chemist. He is the young man who in three years has built up and expanded Canada's explosives program. He was the boy who played stinks at school. He it is now who, in his seemingly aimless fiddling with retorts and test tubes, determines the chemistry of war, for this is, above all, a chemist war. Into this new industry have come skilled and serious young people from the colleges and technical schools of the Dominion. And behind them lies the energy and organization of Canada's great peacetime chemical industry. Like the alchemists of old, they work among flashing glass and liquids. But they seek no philosopher's stone or elixir of life. Their quarry is the elixir of destruction and the chemicals that can later strengthen the failing earth. The strongest explosives are just rearrangements of the things around us, from the air we breathe and the water we drink, or from coke and steam or natural gas, we make pure ammonia, which is many times stronger than the liquid we use in the kitchen. By burning ammonia with air, we turn it into nitric acid. Nitric acid turns harmless substances into dangerous explosives, and you will find nitro in most of our formulas. From coal, we distill toluol, and when toluol and nitric acid are mixed, we get trinitrotoluol, or TNT. TNT is composed of atoms of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, blended into a substance poised on the edge of its own destruction. Trinitrotoluol itself is a combination of toluol and nitric acid. The toluol comes from coal. The nitric acid is formed from oxygen and nitrogen and methane or natural gas. This is how we build these substances into TNT. Hydrogen, formed from the action of water on coal or natural gas, combines with air and forms ammonia. Ammonia combines with oxygen to form nitric acid. Nitric acid, combined with toluol, produces TNT. Both toluol and nitric acid are what we call chemically balanced substances. Their atoms are strongly linked, so that even a great shock will not disturb them. But TNT is a chemically unbalanced substance. When detonated, its atoms explode, sending out a wave which travels at the unbelievable speed of 7,000 yards a second. This terrific expansion destroys everything within reach, and that is what we call an explosion. All that is left is carbon monoxide, nitrogen, and water. And this turns once more into the air we breathe and the water we drink. TNT may fill the shell, but cordite or nitrocellulose powder hurls it from the gun. And the basis of these is wood pulp, stored in great rolls ready to be dumped. Then lowered onto the dryer. Under the heated rollers, the pulp loses all its moisture and is ready to be shredded. Protected against the dust, dexterous workers rake the shredded pulp into barrels and send them up on a monorail to the nitrating room. Cellulose and nitrocellulose look and feel exactly the same, a sort of fluffy kapok-like substance but the strong acids transform the basis for stockings into the basis for a powerful propellant, gun cotton. As gun cotton is explosive when dry, it's kept moist in the preliminary stages. The closest control keeps all operations safe. Whether gun cotton becomes nitrocellulose powder or cordite, it must first have every drop of moisture squeezed out of it and be impregnated with denatured alcohol. 
The blocks that emerge are kneaded up with nitroglycerin and other chemicals, and then go to the extruding room. Here a powerful press transforms the plastic mass into soft, continuous, macaroni-like strips. These must be cut into suitable lengths and then dried into thin brown rods. Bound together like a bundle of sticks, the cordite now comes close to its final shape as the charge behind the shell. Harmless in appearance, it's not a substance to be treated lightly and even the simple matter of cutting goes on behind shatterproof glass. Next, the cordite is accurately weighed and bagged. That's where we come in, fresh to the work, but already with new skills behind us, we do a thousand jobs, and one is filling with black powder the igniter pads that go on the bottom of the cordite bags. You get to learn when you work in an explosives plant that it's all fine, neat work. This is ASA powder on its way to the caps and debts room, caps and detonators. ASA is secret and powerful. You see, a high explosive needs a little bit of sensitive stuff to set it off, like the spark plug in an automobile engine. This material is the most ticklish explosive we handle. It needs care, constant attention. Never hurry. We take every precaution. We work slowly, surely, and carefully. People are surprised when you tell them it's safer to work on caps and debts than on machine shops or construction jobs. But that's the way it is, because we know just what we're handling. Go slow, be careful, check again. In looking over the fuses that decide when the shell will go off, we have one great advantage over the inspectors of the last war, and that's the X-ray machine. When a fuse is completed and sealed tight, the only way to test it used to be by proving. And in the case of ammunition, this destroys the product. So today, we put a great many fuses through giant X-ray machines. When the negatives come out, they go over ground glass screens and any flaw is instantly seen and the batch rejected. That bunch happens to be okay, and most of them are. Some of us work on the tetral line, filling little bags with this powerful explosive that boosts off the main charge. We wear masks against the dust, and every girl, as soon as she comes off the line, takes a shower in the resident shower room. Many of us live in clean new staff houses close to the plants. There's two girls to a room, and the house mother lets us decorate the rooms any way we want to, just so as we feel at home. Well, there's lots to do around an explosives plant. Every residential center has its own community hall. You can see movies at 15 cents a show, or you can go dancing with your boyfriend. Competition between the different lines is keen. You see some fine bowling around our staff houses. On the shell filling line, the work of the chemist and the cordite girl, the engineer and the lab worker comes to a climax. For here the long train of tiny industrial processes reaches at last a shape you can recognize 
as an efficient instrument of war. As the empty shells are scoured of Greece and moved forward on endless belts, the skills of a hundred different callings all come together. Men pour the hot liquid amatol, which goes into the shells. It might be wet cornmeal. It might. The 7.2 inch is one of the biggest projectiles made in Canada, the spearhead of a yearly production of over 27 million shells. Expert workers place in its nose the tetral pellet, which forms the booster charge, and screw it carefully into place. Now the shells with hooks attached go onto an endless monorail on their final journey to the spray room. Here the painters, with a deft flick of the wrist, spray them bright yellow. Then they stencil them with a the government stamp. The flow of shell sweeps down from the 7.2 right to the Beaufort's 40 millimeter, the anti-tank shell, and up again to the 3.7 anti-aircraft. The 3.7, as yet still shell and cartridge, slides along the conveyor belt to be crimped together. Like doctors performing a surgical operation in a great hospital, the white-coated workers in the cavernous assembly plants complete the round and adjust the fuse. Men of the shipping division trundle the completed rounds into boxcars, waiting on stub lines right inside the plant. And as they tamp the last retaining crib work into place, they see before them the sleek pattern of efficient destruction, which is also the pattern of victory. Time to go off shift now. It's late. The cigarette tastes good after eight hours without one. But the work still goes on. Yes, they're yours, Mike, and ours. For we know that this mountain power for destruction brings ever closer the day when Canada's industrial workers and chemists will use their strength to build a better world.